the book of Joel, and we're going to deal with chapter one, little three chapter book that we're going to deal with here. Now, as you just by way of perspective, uh, you know that after Solomon died, the, the kingdom split into two: the southern kingdom, called, causing itself, calling itself Judah; the northern kingdom, which we're going to try to use that label so we don't confuse people, because it called itself the House of Israel. Just as a little footnote, you might find interesting. The International Standard Version is considering change in translating the word Israelite throughout the Old and New Testament as Israelis. <laughs> and it's perfectly acceptable modern translation, but it does carry a little different flavor. <laughs> and uh, so that'll stir up some, some, some opposition. But in any case, we're going to focus on the Second Kings portion. Uh, First Kings is the top half of this uh, chart. Uh, Second Kings at the bottom. We'll focus on that to be able to get at a little more detail. And, uh, of course, the Assyrian captivity uh, it, it ends up taking over the northern kingdom, as you know. But, uh, and Nineveh is a capital of that, and that will feature in our, our profile here. Um, the southern kingdom, of course, gets uh, drawn into the uh, Babylonian captivity from which it returns, which is a distinctive. The northern kingdom does not return as an entity. Uh, from the Assyrian captivity, because the Assyrians get conquered by Babylon, and so the captives get commingled. But the Babylonian captivity does come to an end, and the the Jews are uh, permitted to return, which includes members of all 12 tribes, by the way. So I don't want to get into the lost 12 tribes thing here, but just keep that in focus here. And of course, after the Babylonian captivity, we call that the, ex the, the post-exile period under Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, uh, all under the leadership of Zerubbabel. But uh, the, uh, now the major prophets, of course, we're all familiar with. There's four major ones, and they fit in pretty clearly with Daniel and Ezekiel being the uh, Babylonian uh, prophets. Uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah uh, prophesying to Judah um, uh, sequentially there. But now the minor prophets is the group that we're exploring here. There's 12 of them, and they're in a peculiar order um, in the... Uh, Word. And again, minor is just a librarian's term. Um, Isaiah is the biggest, so it's a major pro uh, uh, prophet. The minor prophets are smaller. In fact, Joel, here's Joel, a little three-chapter book, but it's pivotal for prophecy, as you quickly discover. And uh, uh, we, they each, uh, Joel speaks, of course, to the southern kingdom, but each one of these uh, fit at a different point in time, and I won't elaborate on all of that. This is by way of review, but just so you have a focus here. And... Uh, we have uh, the uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and uh, Malachi being the post-exile uh, prophets. But, uh, and then after that, we have the New Testament after a 400-year period, which is in the Bible. People call it the silent years, but it actually is detailed for you in Daniel 11, verses 5 to 35, in advance. So precise that the critics have said that it must have been written later and all that sort of nonsense. But in any case, um, these uh, prophets are in a strange order in your Bible, if you classify them in terms of the northern kingdom couple, Hosea and uh, Amos, and then the two to Nineveh, which was both Jonah and Nahum, then you have the uh, five of them, that, uh, of the minor prophets, that speak to the southern kingdom, of which Joel is the first. And we're going to talk more about its timing here as we go. But uh, that's an order that uh, uh, we, we think is a little more logical in terms of who they're addressing. And uh, so... The chronological order of these, if we just look at it that way, before the exile, of course, Obadiah spoke to Edom. We figure about 887 B.C. That's very early. Jonah to Nineveh, about 862. These are all ushers' dates, by the way. Not that that's the, the last word, but it's a, it's a comfortable reference, at least relative to one to another here. And uh, Joel uh, addresses himself to Judah primarily in 800 B.C., uh, somewhere between 835 and 756, we figure. Amos uh, 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 takes his message to the northern kingdom about 787. Hosea, uh, just about that same time. Isaiah overlaps some of these from 760 to 698. And then Micah and Nahum and then uh, Zephaniah and uh, Habakkuk and, uh, and Jeremiah. Now Jeremiah, I've listed here because he starts before the exile, but he's usually also listed as an exile prophet. So during the exile, we have Jeremiah followed by Ezekiel. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem at the time, and Daniel, who was deported in the first deportation, 607. So, and then, of course, after the exile, we have the three that we 
comfortably uh, recognized for those. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. From, from the, uh, through the 6th century into the 4th. And so uh, between the Testaments, as I've mentioned, is also uh, reckoned here, if you like. But now dating. Most scholars duck the issue of dating. But it could be written very early. 838 to 756 is a common estimate. Uh, possibly in the early days of the King jo Joash, 870 to 865. They, it's re regarded by many commentators as the earliest writing prophet. And uh, Joel is quoted twice by Amos, incidentally, um, and uh, that would place him prior to the prophet Amos. So that part is a comfortable piece of it. But he doesn't rail against idolatry the way Amos did, so he probably prophesied at about 835 during the reign of Joash. And uh, there's no mention of either the Assyrian or the Babylonian invasions, which places him certainly before either one of those. Uh, the only enemies are mentioned are the Philistines, Phoenicians, Edomites, and Egyptians. And uh, had he lived after Joash, he would have doubtless have mentioned the Syrians among the enemies whom he enumerates, since they took Jerusalem and carried off an immense spoil to Damascus, Second Chronicles 24 and so on. So there are some arguments from silence, which is, uh, 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 needs to be done cautiously. No idolatry is mentioned. However, the temple services, the priesthood, other institutions of the theocracy are represented as flourishing. So this all answers to the state of things under the high priesthood of Jehoiada, through whom Joash had been placed on the throne and who lived in the early days of Joash. Now there's another dimension to this. There's no king mentioned, and this is interesting. There's no king mentioned. It's possible that Joel may have written during the period there was no king in Israel. Now many people overlook this. There was a period of time there was no king. Uh, queen Athaliah had the royal seed of Judah murdered. And after the death of King Ahaziah, the queen had all of her grandchildren put to death. But the baby Joash was spared, the only surviving royal seed. Uh, he was hidden by his aunt. Jehoshaphat and uh, Jehoiada, the high priest, in the temple complex. An interesting uh, intrigue going on here. Seven years later, Joash was crowned as the king of Judah. Queen Athaliah was slain by her own people. This is all in 2 Kings 11, for those that want to check it out. So it, it's suggestive that the book of Joel could have been written just prior to Joash's coronation in 835 B.C. That's a conjecture, but it seems to fit the facts that we do have. And uh, Joel prophesied as one of the early prophets for sure. There were actually quite a few prophets, by the way, over 50 of them. And it's generally conceded by conservative scholars that Joel prophesied about the time of Joash, the king of Judah. So that's a, a widely held uh, concession. And Joel was uh, apparently contemporary with and probably knew both Elijah and Elisha, who, of course, were dealing with the northern kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Israel. And uh, Joel, of course, is focusing on the south. But he, his, 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 his uh, reign, or I shouldn't say reign, but his uh, venue would uh, overlap those two guys. Over, he, he saw some interesting history. And it's remarkable that the earliest of the prophets included the fullest view of the consummation of all written prophecy. Let me let that sink in for a minute. Here's Joel, who was one, probably one of the earliest writing prophets. See, Elisha and Elijah didn't really write themselves, so they're not considered writing prophets. Uh, earliest writing prophets. And yet, even though it's a small little book, it has the fullest view of the consummation of all written prophecy. Wow, okay? The book of Joel is a neglected book among Bible scholars. It's surprising how many people study prophecy who have never studied the book of Joel in depth. So I think this, is, this should get your attention. I hope you... It's an important book because it records Israel's place in God's program from Babylon all the way through the millennium. And that should get the attention of many of our denominational churches which have very strange um, attitudes towards the millennium and all of that. Joel also has a lot to say about the Gentile nations and their collision course toward Armageddon. So it's even though it's a very Jewish book focusing on Judah, it's, it really commands our attention as Gentile believers. And the primary theme of the book is the day of the Lord. That's a term we're going to talk, be talking a lot about through the, uh, the, the study. The order of events are all summarized in chapter 2 and 3. 
Chapter 2, the first 10 verses, will deal with the Gentile invasion that's forthcoming and Armageddon. And uh, the destruction of the invaders is dealt with in verse 11 of that chapter. Then the repentance of Judah that results in all that, and then the response of Yorivafe uh, to uh, uh, all of that. And the effusion of the Holy Spirit that's given that Peter makes allusion to an Acts that causes a lot of confusion. We'll be dealing with that when we get to that in chapter 2. And then the return and establishing the kingdom closes that chapter. And chapter 3 will deal with the judgment of all the nations and the full kingdom blessing that follows. So that's quite a, a panorama of prophetic insight from this little short book. The book of Joel will make two major points. First, that God is in control of world events. Boy, we need to understand that. Uh, Israel, of course, clings to that for a lot of good reasons. But we also, as we uh, uh, face and get challenged by the predicament here in our own country, we need to remind ourselves that God is in control of world events. We might not like what we're seeing and so forth, but we need to understand God is in control. Nothing happens anywhere in the world that is outside of God's control. You say, well, that sounds, that's obvious. Sometimes the obvious we need to keep in front of us here. Secondly, nothing that happens to a believer is outside of God's control. So let's keep that in front of us. That's one of, that's one of the two major points of this little book. The second point is that God responds to repentance. Boy, do we need to renew our faith in that. As we look at our country and the, 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 the disastrous path it's on, uh, we realize that God is always open to repentance. Repentance may seem very distant to us here in this country, collectively speaking, but uh, God will respond if we do. Where there is true repentance, God will respond accordingly. The name Joel itself means Yahweh or Yehode, Yehode, the, the rabbis usually pronounce the four letters rather than pronouncing the name. So Yote Vave is, is the four letters that make up what some people would call Yahweh. But in any case, he is God. And this is a reversal or an inversion of the name Elijah, which means God is Jehovah. It's just a, it's an inversion, if you will. There's no personal history available on the prophet Joel. But we do know that he speaks to Judah from Jerusalem. That's pretty obvious from his writings. And the temple is mentioned four times. And so it apparently was standing when he wrote, which means it's prior to the Babylonian and all that stuff. Joel is quoted in Amos chapter 1, which means the book was already in existence when Amos wrote, as I mentioned before. Joel's theme is the day of the Lord. He makes specific reference to it five times. Now this is a term that is subject to a lot of misunderstandings and confusion. We need to really pay some attention to this and try to understand what that embraces. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel all refer to the day of the Lord. Sometimes they call it that day. It's so obvious they just refer to it that day. Zechariah particularly emphasizes that day. And what is that day? It's the day of the Lord or the day of Yodhivave or Jehovah, Yahweh, however you want to say it. Joel is the one who introduces the day of the Lord to prophecy. So this is, there's a very interesting concept in the scripture that uh, many uh, uh, commentators make note of. And that is the first mention of a concept is usually very significant. The first mention is very, very significant. And uh, the first mention of the word love in the Bible is in Genesis 22 and with the act of love by the Father. And uh, you can go through a whole bunch of interesting places where the first mention turns out to be profoundly significant. That leads to a, a summary uh, phrase uh, uh, that the, the, what they call it the law of first mention. Well, this is the first mention of the day of the Lord chronologically uh, in the Bible. So we want to pay attention to that. The day of the Lord is a technical expression in Scripture, and it's fraught with meaning. We're going to be spending a lot of time on that in the next couple of sessions. It includes the millennial kingdom, which will come and be established at the second coming of Christ. But Joel is going to make it very clear that it begins with the great tribulation period, the time of great trouble. And there's some debate about whether the great tribulation is part of the day of the Lord or the day of the Lord just follows it, and we'll touch on that here in a minute. And if you want to set a boundary parenthesis at the end of the day of the Lord, uh, the, G the Lord Jesus uh, puts down all unrighteousness and establishes his eternal kingdom here upon the earth. In other words, the millennium is included in the span of the day of the Lord. And uh, James, at the great council, you know, one of the most important chapters in the Bible, uh, of course, is uh, Acts 15, 
a great council in Jerusalem. And James presides over that. And he more or less outlines the relationship between the church age and the period known as the day of the Lord. Because in Acts uh, chapter 15, verses 14 through 16, he says, Simeon, or Simon, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree, the words of the prophet, as it is written, and then, then what James is doing, he's quoting from Amos chapter 9, verse 11, in which he says, after this, I will return. You know, that's a strange expression to find in the Old Testament. God speaking through Amos says, Af after this, I will return. The grammar requires for him to return, he must have left it. Yeah, which he's left heaven and he's apparently on there. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David. That's a very unusual expression. It occurs a couple of times in the scripture. It's not the temple of Solomon, it's the tabernacle of David. You're talking about kingship here, emphasized rather than priesthood. Tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. Wow. Now, James then go in, in, it says here, after this, after what? After he calls out the church from this world, God will again turn his program with Israel, and it is to this time that the day of the Lord refers. One of the concepts that um, uh, you need to uh, develop this for your, from your own study, but I'm going to suggest that you be sensitive to the possibility that, 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 that God seems to deal with the church and with Israel mutually exclusively. There's all kinds of things that will occur once the church is removed. And while the church is here, God is dealing in one particular kind of mode that we're very familiar with. But we need to realize that the church will be removed and then God's going to deal separately, differently, with Israel. And uh, Paul emphasized that in Romans 11:25 and a number of other passages. So don't just accept it. Uh, I'm, I'm mentioning this to, to, to simplify, to make you alert to that possibility. After he calls out the church from this world, God will again turn his program to Israel. That's the theme here. And so he continues in Acts 15, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things known unto God, or all his works, from the beginning of the world. Praise God. So today, God is calling out of the Gentiles a people. In that day, day of the Lord, all the Gentiles who will be entering the kingdom will seek the Lord. I think there's going to be a tremendous turning to God at that time, unlike any that the church has ever witnessed. There are many scholars that believe that more people will be saved after the rapture than before. Interestingly enough, that's a conjecture, but there is, it's a view that you might uh, keep in the back of your mind. And as I mentioned, Joel is quoted twice in the New Testament, uh, and, and, and they're both from this passage in Acts 2, that we'll, uh, in, in uh, Joel chapter 2, that we'll talk about. Uh, it was qu it quoted in Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 21 by Peter, and Paul also makes allusion to it in Romans 10, and it, uh, many people from that get confused. We'll deal with that in detail when we get there. But let's just jump in to Joel chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. The Hebrew phraseology here actually means the word of Jehovah took possession of Joel. The language there is very strong. It isn't that uh, he's whispering in his ear. No, he, he the word of, of Yorivave took possession of Joel is what the Hebrew really uh, 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 says behind that translation. And Joel, of course, was a common name. It means Jehovah is God. And it's an inversion, as I said, of Elijah, which means God is Jehovah. It's kind of interesting that, because they, they probably knew each other. I think that's very interesting. And uh, this boy's father was Pethuel, which means open-heartedness of God. Or some people would translate that as the sincerity of God. That's the name of his father. So I can, uh, I can assume that he comes from a strong background, spiritually. And then he continues, verse 2, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land, that's a, broad, that's a broad sweep there. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your father? What he's going to describe here is a disaster, the likes of which would not have been in the memory of anyone alive. He says, hey, here they give you all. He's going to talk about this, a locust invasion. 
In chapter 1, he's going to focus on an absolutely devastating locust invasion, and they were literal locusts, a literal devastation. But he's using it as a springboard, as a metaphor, if you will, of what's forthcoming on the world. And so the, the, the same thing, but with the decimal point moved over, so to speak, okay? He says, hear this old men. Interesting, there's always a value in traditions. We need to remember that. All through the Old Testament, it says, don't, don't move the ancient landmark. And it's not talking about property lines. It's talking about basically recognizing the stabilizing aspect of tradition. There's value in traditions. And the elders, who typically sat at the, at the uh, city gates, which was like the city hall, uh, were considered the best judges of things. And so anyway, what he's setting up here, though, this is going to be the most unique invasion of locusts in all previous history. That's why he's going to use this as such a powerful idiom here. And he's going to dwell about this devastation. And it's more awesome than you and I have the capacity to imagine. He, says, uh, he also says, tell you to your children. Moses had instructed Israel to rehearse the works of God to, uh, to their children. We're going to notice that. It's interesting how uh, there, we are admonished all through the Scripture to instruct our children. And uh, one could probably uh, attribute the predicament of America to the absence of discussions at the family dinner table. The only people, only kids that have any grasp of the heritage are those that have grown up in military families. Most, uh, most, uh, uh, most American families have no grasp don't share over the dinner table the realities of where we've come from. So, so why, do, why should you tell your children? Well, to remind them of God's mercy and goodness, to remind them that God would judge sin if they became disobedient. Echoing, of course, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 and so on. And uh, Sometimes natural disasters are warnings of more to come. And Joel uses this as a springboard to the big one. The day of the Lord. His whole discussion that's going to forthcoming here about this locust is a setup for what he's really going to be driving at subsequently. So in verse three, uh, chapter Joel chapter one, verse three, tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. And you know, I, what, I, as I was preparing this, I couldn't um, let go of the realization how this applies to us. What has been the result? of the absence of adequate focus on our heritage within our own families. That we have, we have a, a whole generation, in fact several generations in this country that have no grasp of where we've come from, what we stood for, and, and, and so forth. And I don't know, can that kind of thing be repaired? That's the question. Moving on with Joel here, verse 4. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the cankerworm eaten, and that which the cankerworm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Now the translation is dealing with four different creatures here, kinds of creatures here. Now the word locust, this is the worst plague they'd experienced since the plague in Egypt in Exodus 10. And we'll take a look at, we'll, take a, use, uh, we'll springboard and take a quick summary of what happened in Egypt in here in a minute. Uh, the locusts have been called the incarnation of hunger. The incarnation of hunger. Now, locusts are othopotarians, along with cockroaches, mantises, grasshoppers, and crickets. I thought you'd like to know that. There are 24,000 different species. In fact, 282 species in Arizona alone. Some can grow up to 10 inches in length. Does that alter your perspective of locusts? Wow. They multiply by parthenogenesis, which means if the male isn't around, the female can take care of it by herself. <laughs> so I'm going to leave that one alone. Let's move on. The larvae go through four to 13 stages, sometimes taking six to seven years to fully mature. Scientists have found a single hormone that, when activated, causes the locusts to swarm. They become aggressive and gregarious, the hormone causes changes in coloration, physiology, metabolism, and behavior. When they swarm, they eat not only the plants, but the roots below the ground. You can actually hear their munching sounds at night. That was, that's got to be creepy. 
They travel in compact, military-like march. They make wind-like noise in flight. They can even darken the sun. They can fly 17 hours at a time. Swarms have been spotted 1,200 miles out to sea. In 1889, a swarm in the Red Sea was spotted that covered 2,000 square miles. The density in a swarm can be 120 million locusts per square mile. You and I can't imagine that. You can't imagine that. Each female locust can lay 250 to 300 pods with 70 to 80 eggs per pod. Wow. In Cyprus in 1881, 1,300 tons of egg were laid. And there's four different Hebrew terms in this passage. The first is gazam, which is a term for the gnawing locust. He emerges from the egg in the spring, typically has no wings at that stage. Then the second thing that's mentioned in the Hebrew here is arbe, which is a swarming locust. That's the most common winged locust. Third one is the licking locust, translated caterpillar in your King James Version. Uh, it's the third phase. It's the old skin, small wings. And then the fourth phase is the consuming locust, translated canker worm in your, in your uh, uh, King James. It's about three inches long and about one inch antenna, typically. So there's different views. Some feel that these are four different kinds of locusts. Others think it's the different phases of a specific locust. It really doesn't matter, but I mention this just so you have the benefit of other commentators' analysis here. The devastation to the community occurred not only because of the loss of subs, uh, uh, subsistence, but the spread of disease and the loss of trade that follows and the inevitable inflation and could literally wipe it out. It actually can wipe out an entire civilization. And uh, J. Vernon McGee make, uh, also, he's the only one that I noticed makes a suggestion that these four locusts might be suggesting a parallel to the four horsemen of the, of the apocalypse. There isn't a direct linkage I don't see that at least, but the fact that four does seem to be a number of completion of a certain kind of, of, of judgment. Now Joel, I believe, was not talking about four different kinds of locusts. He was speaking of four successive swarms of locusts that was eating what the previous swarm had left behind. I think that's the flavor of the passage. And four is often used by prophets to designate the totality of destruction. Jeremiah 15, Ezekiel 14, elsewhere. Uh, swarms of locusts, each swarm eating what the previous swarm had left behind is the flavor, I believe, of the passage. Now just as we're dealing with this, let's take a quick summary and remember a little bit what happened in Egypt. It's amazing to me to notice throughout the, Old, throughout the Bible how often God makes reference to the deliverance from Egypt as one of his biggest demonstrations. And uh, uh, the judgment in Egypt was against the gods they worship, we know from Numbers 33 and elsewhere. It was a very public display of power on God's part, and thus a warning to other nations. We notice Rahab responds to that in Joshua 2, and the Philistines make reference to that. This, 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 this uh, uh, got everyone's attention. It had, not all the plagues had warning. The first one had a warning, waters turned to blood in, in Exodus 7. Then came warning number two, frogs were on the land and in the homes and all of that. The third uh, 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 plague didn't have a warning, as if that's t teaching us a lesson. The lice on the persons, and in fact that was the one that really shook up the priesthood in Egypt because that meant they couldn't, uh, it prevented their worship by the priest. That was something that, that got to them somehow. The magicians could not reproduce this one. They apparently could reproduce the other ones or felt they could. And uh, they did this three other. They did this on th at three other times. The rods into serpents, the water into blood, and the frogs were things that the the priesthood in Egypt was able to simulate. And uh, the uh, and we should compare miracles by enemies. The other lesson here is the enemies can do miracles. Let's re remember that. And that, of course, is echoed in Revelation 16 and elsewhere. Then came warning number three: the flies in the homes. Beelzebub being the fly god and all that. Warning number four, we had disease on the cattle. Then again, we have no warning for the sixth one, the boils and sores on man and beast. Warning number five, we had thunder and hail. Warning number six, we had the locusts, in which Pharaoh ad ad himself admits, I have sinned, interestingly enough. Then there was no warning, and we had darkness for three days. And uh, then warning number seven was the firstborn man and beast. 
and, and that, was the, that, that was also initially predicted. Many people miss this because the, the movie, The Ten Commandments, misses this point. That the death of the firstborn was predicted at the burning bush when Moses was first called. If you look at it carefully, chapter 4, verse 22 and 23. Um, and Israel, of course, was God's firstborn. That was the, the, the parallelism going on there. Now, one of the things you, could, you may want to do is study other patterns of plagues. Um, in, in, this, in the, ten, in the uh, ten plagues of Egypt, the first three were done with the rod of iron, the next three were done with no rod, and the next three were done with the rod of Moses. Is that significant? I don't know, but it's interesting. I, what I'm always fascinated by is the evidence of design. These things are not, ca they don't just happen, they're very skillfully designed. In chapter 5 and 6 we have the cattle involved, and we notice that they all get, also get chiasmic, uh, chiasmic order here. Um, the fourth and seventh one, Goshen is exempted. The third and eighth one is admission by enemies. Second and nine are darkness and first and ten. That's the, the, it's the inversion. Notice the, notice, the, notice the patterning going on here, for what it's worth. And I encourage you to study the other prophetic patterns of judgments. The Jacob's trouble and affliction in Isaiah 60 and Jeremiah 30 deserve our attention. And uh, we could go through a whole bunch of these. I won't take the time because they're not, they don't all necessarily directly relate to Joel. But I think studying the judgments of God throughout the scripture is a worthwhile background exercise. And, uh, how, how, and uh, how often um, God's judgment will also uh, uh, involve miracles, but also the enemies will also perform them. And I think that's worth noticing that pattern uh, through the, throughout the scripture. Okay, so all those things are repeated in the book of Revelation. So if you're going to study the book of Revelation, you want to really go at that with a good background on what happened in Exodus with the, uh, with the, the various um, uh, insights we gain from the text uh, in, the de in the days of the Exodus. Now, see, on the one hand, Joel's plague of locusts was very literal, as we clearly from verse 3 of chapter 1. So that, well, they were actual locusts. Don't misunderstand me. And uh, the... Uh, it's interesting that uh, on the one hand they're very literal, on the other hand he's using them to springboard something much, much broader. Because there's something else going on, something far more sinister. And uh, you do want to understand that uh, even the locusts are so military, the, the scripture tells us they have no king. So that tells us that the locusts that appear in elsewhere in the scripture as a metaphor are... Um, if they have a king, and they do, in, in Revelation 9, that king is a demon king. So the locusts are often used idiomatically to represent demons. I'm not saying they were, uh, 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 I'm not suggesting the locusts in Joel 1 are demons. They're simply a device he's using to get their attention to dramatize what's forthcoming that is going to be very demonic. So you want to compare uh, Revelation 9 uh, with uh, these things, and also the early verses of Amos. Because several times God talks there to Amos about uh, plagues he's going to bring, and Amos talks him out of it. And he changes his mind. Very interesting passage in the first few verses of Amos 7, but we'll keep going here. By the time you get the fifth verse here, uh, Joel is going to start singling out some people that he's trying to get their attention. He says, Awake ye drunkards, and weep. And howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. And uh, with all these locusts, they're not going to have much of a grape harvest. They, the, the locusts have gotten to the grapes first. They've stripped all the vineyards. There'll be no more wine for the drunkards. And you, this is, uh, some of the commentators here will take a whole detour and get into the whole issue of drinking and drunkards and all of that. And we could quickly summarize a lot of statistics that are pretty, uh, 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 these, are not out of, these are a little out of date. But I didn't take the time in these notes to bring it up to date. I don't think anyone would, uh, would be surprised by the percentage of deaths and homicides and suicides and auto accidents that are attributed to drunkenness. So that's a, that's a heavy thing. I don't think that's Joseph's prime, uh, Joel's primary focus here, but we'll keep moving on. For a nation is come up upon the, my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion and hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Wow. A nation? I thought we were talking about locusts. No, see, he, Joel is now shifting. He's setting the stage for what's coming in the next couple of chapters. And uh, so he's, he's using that just as a springboard. 
Now they have teeth like a lion or a lioness. Remember Revelation 9. Both locusts and ants, by the way, are often depicted as a military army. Proverbs 30 and elsewhere. Joel continues, He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Now the locusts obviously are destroying the real fig tree, but Joel may be dealing with a double entendre here. He says, my vine, my fig tree, God speaking through him. In other words, God's own house of Israel and Judah are represented by the vine and the fig tree. And they're usually mentioned together. Well, wait a minute. Is the vine the symbol of Israel or is it the fig tree? There are four of these. And uh, uh, here the fig is supposed to rule over others. Let's take a look at this. Uh, jo remember Jotham's parable. The key to understanding these idioms, interestingly enough, are tucked away in a few verses in the book of Judges, where Jotham confronts them with a parable. And I won't go through the whole passage here, but when you get uh, Joshua and I, you'll note, discover that Jotham speaks of the olive tree, uh, which speaks of valuable oil, of course, the fig tree, which is a sweet fruit, the vine, uh, which produces wine, of course, and a bramble bush, which is not good for anything. Doesn't put any fruit, doesn't even give you shade. It's just good for fuel to the fire. And it, from that parable, when you understand what, what um, Jotham is doing there, he's referring to the nation in all four idioms. The olive tree speaks of genetic relationships. We're grafted in as Gentiles. The fig tree is the political dimension of this. And, and remember, Jesus cursed it because it didn't bear fruit. And then the vine is the spiritual, wine being uh, idiomatic here uh, of the spiritual dimension. And the bramble is Satan's empire, only good for fuel. And uh, so that from that parable, it's interesting, the rabbis pointed out to me, that you'll discover as you see these idioms used throughout the scripture, yes, they're referring to Israel or the nation, but in, a, in the flavor they're speaking of is in one of those dimensions. Let's move on to verse 8. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for a husband of her youth. This is a passage that's a little confusing because of our confusion about the, the term virgin. And uh, it actually begins 10 different things to do. But the, the young virgin, in here the concept is one, someone that's betrothed or married, in Deuteronomy 22 or 9. The term virgin here does not mean virgin as we think of it today, but as a young widow who has lost her husband in the first year of marriage, is the flavor here. The whole nation is to mourn as a bride who has lost her husband in her first year of marriage. That's the, that's the, the, the tone of what's being suggested here uh, uh, in the text. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. Wow. See, one of the reasons, this is another reason we believe that Joe is writing from Jerusalem, because he he focuses in on this. Why are they weeping? Well, because the offerings are cut off. With the locusts having destroyed everything, there's nothing to give offerings, so there's now no remedy for sin. That's very interesting in terms of the parallel today because there's no remedy for sin in Jerusalem today because there's no temple at all. Where does Israel offer now? There's no altar today. Judah has a very serious problem. They tried to deal with that in the Council of Yomni in 90 AD by redefining Judaism. The Judah, Judaism of today bears little resemblance to Mosaic Judaism because Mosaic Judaism depended on the shedding of blood for the remission of sins. And there is no shedding of the blood today. So there's a, there's a thing, they've got a difficulty. Anyway, Joel again describes here the totality of the devastation. Because that's, there's, no, there's no joy of harvest. There's no, uh, all the way from, from verses 10, 11, and 12 that are following, you'll see the, the whole absence of harvest is the theme here. The field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. So he's already spoken to the drunkards, he's spoken to the priests, now he's going to start speaking to the farmers. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, howl, O ye wine, vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, the fig tree languishes, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Boy, the apple tree. It's actually the tupa watch, which is a, it could include, it's a generic term, could include orange, lemon, or pear tree if you want to make a point of that. But you get the flavor of what Joel is saying here. 
Gird yourselves, and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Lie all night in sackcloth, he says. And uh, we can talk about Ahab in 1 Kings 21. I'll let you dig that up yourself. Let's just keep moving here. Sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. See, now the previous passages here spoke of the historic invasion of locusts. He's now going to give rise uh, to a prophetic invasion, an invasion of demons. That's what's going to be unfolding here shortly. They are in desolation. Remember Nineveh. They were 40 days from ground zero. You know, I really find myself continuing to dwell on Nineveh because the, uh, as, you, as, you, as we face the desolation in America spiritually, um, we want to remember that Nineveh is 40 days from being totally destroyed by God. And within those 40 days, from the top on down, they repented, put sackcloth on the animals. And within 40 days, they repented, and God forgave them. And they got a whole another 100 years. And that's such an important um, event, because that was a Gentile nation. We're not talking Israel here, we're talking Nineveh, capital of the Assyrian Empire. The enemy is of Israel, actually. They too were under, God was going to announce that your 40 days from comes destruction. But they repented and, and God, boy, there's, there's huge encouragement that we need to embrace and take to prayer in that. Anyway, remember Jonah was reluctant, but he finally relayed God's message and repent and save the land. As you know, you know the story. Joel continues, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty it shall come. So this is the first mention of the day of the Lord. And it's going to echo through all the other prophets. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is at hand. During the day of Yorivavi, there will be an invasion that will prove to be even more unique than the locust invasion that had just occurred. So Joel's just using it as an idiom of departure here. The day of the Lord. One of the most misunderstood terms and yet one of the most important in Scripture. So we wanna, we'll be dealing with this all through this study. Joel apparently was the first to use it. And he makes it very clear what the day of the Lord is. After him, all the other prophets had to do was to speak of that day. And it was understood as to what they were, re to what they were referring now, the, one of the questions that we're going to deal with here, how does the Great Tribulation open? It opens with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. There's a false peace, then war breaks out, followed by a famine, and finally the pale horse of death, right? So there's a real parallelism between the Great Tribulation as echoed in the other prophets and the way we see it portrayed in uh, Re Revelation chapter 6. There's a parallel, the parallel between these four bands of locusts and the four horsemen of the apocalypse I think is interesting. During the tribulation period, it will not be literal locusts. It will be something far worse that is going to ride, not just through that land, but through the entire world. And the world will be totally devastated when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth to set up his kingdom. He even warns us in Matthew 24 that unless the, if, 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 uh, uh, the, those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. So that's being interrupted by the return of Christ, which starts the day of the Lord. Now, there's four days spoken of in the Scripture. And obviously, uh, the man's day is alluded to 1 Corinthians 4.3. Um, and uh, the, uh, it's portrayed by a metal image. Remember, it was a metal, an image of man from Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar to the end. The day of man started, in a sense... Uh, in, the, in that sense, in Daniel 2, I would argue that it started in Genesis chapter 3. The day of Christ is another phrase. It climaxes at the rapture, of course. The day of Yotivave, the day of the Lord we're dealing with here, is also mentioned in Amos and Zephaniah and Isaiah and so on. 
And the day of God is a, is the climax at the end of the millennium. Well, let's take a look at this another way. If, we, if when we go through the, if you've studied our learn the Bible in 24 hours, you know we talk about a timeline from creation to the end, and uh, that gets divided up in into thousand year segments by some, and the la- you know, each one of those little marks there on the chart here about a thousand years, right? Well. From the beginning, whenever you want to start counting it, to the to where we are here with Joel, we'll call that the day of man, and that climaxes by the utter failure of man to be able to handle the situation. The whole message of the great tribulation—that's the playing out of man's attempt to create a global government and run him run things himself, run things without the 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 involvement of God—and that's a disaster. And it's a climactic disaster that we call the Great Tribulation. Or I should say Jesus labeled the Great Tribulation. But then that gets interrupted by the day of yod heh Now, I don't want to make a big thing of this Great Tribulation issue. There are many commentators that regard the Great Tribulation as the beginning of the day of yod heh There are some that have been far more... Um, specific in their exegetical analysis that would argue the Great Tribulation is interrupted by the, great, the, 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 the uh, day of yod heh That it, it, it's, a, it's perhaps a, um, a metaphorical uh, debate as to where that fits. Clearly the Great Tribulation is the, is the end of the day of man and the beginning of the day, to, day of yod heh But I think the, uh, seeing it as the ultimate failure of man that causes God to step in is, I think, a legitimate perspective. Anyway, Joel continues, verse 15, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Wow. Now, the destruction, of, there's a word play going on here. Shod is destruction, and Shaddai is the Almighty, or uh, El Shaddai. And so there's a little bit of wordplay in the background here. So the day of the Lord, widely misunderstood. It occurs 75 times in the Bible and five times in Joel alone. And I suspect it is distinct from the Great Tribulation. It, it, it's the occurrence it, it, that causes the day of the Lord to begin, yes. It's a, it, I think there's a, it's in contrast with man's day. The failure of humanism. The failure of the times of the Gentiles, which did start, of course, in Daniel chapter 2. And uh, the climactic result of, of all of this is then the Great Tribulation. And uh, God has to intervene to save some flesh here. The, day, the word day itself occurs over 2,000 times, over 2,200 times uh, in the Scripture. And it doesn't always mean a 24-hour period. It means a period of time. And it's used <coughs> idiomatically in a number of ways and uh, for what it's worth. But... Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, over 40 different ways, actually. So that's not, that's not our issue anyway. Now, there are some ambiguities we should be aware of. In the King James translators, they were pers- purposefully inconsistent in rendering the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek phrases to keep it flowing. They, they felt the repetition would make it tediously. But they didn't allow for the fact there may have been purposeful repetition as significant stressing on behalf of the original authors. And, uh, and uh, that's what uh, Willie Adams and others that have, have come pointed out. If you really do an, a, a very careful exegetical analysis, there is more repetitive use of those terms than shows up in your translation because the translators are trying to, to, to make it flow. The day of the Lord has 25 uh, uh, uses in the Old Testament and the New Testament, plus 26 synonyms. And 196 total uses of that phrase. The Great Tribulation it has 27 synonyms, and it's differentiated from the Day of the Lord, which begins when the Great Tribulation ends, the Day of Man, in the view of some. It's not a universal view, I should point out, but I think the view has some merit. The synonyms for the Day of the Lord, the Day of Trouble, Day of Vengeance, Day of Wrath, Day of Calamity, Day of Christ... And when you, when you get it into the actual occasions here, you'll realize it's not necessarily the Great Tribulation. It's dealing with God's intervention here. The day of His fierce anger. The day of the Lord's anger. 
Day of indignation. Day of, destroy, day of battle and war. Day of thy power. Day of grief and desperate sorrow. The day of the Lord's sacrifice. Day of the trouble and distress. Tr day of trumpet and alarm. The day of his coming. Aha. Uh -huh. Day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath of the Lamb is involved. See, the Great Tribulation involves troubles that are brought, that man has brought upon himself. We're dealing here with uh, Dr. Lewis Sperry Chafer, in regards to this term, the man's day, says this theme occurred by at times by translators is referred to but once in the New Testament, namely 1 Corinthians 4 3, which reads, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, and of man's judgment, yea, I judge not mine own self. Now the pa in this passage, man's judgment is really a reference to human opinion current in this age, which might properly and literally be translated man's day or humanism. That's, that's, the, that's, that's really the, 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 the belief of the time. Moving on in Joel, verse 16, Is not meat cut off before your eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed is rotten under the clouds. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do beasts groan? The herds of the cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of the sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry. For the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee. For the rivers of the waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. So we see what Joel is obviously contrasting here is the devastation, the un unbelievable devastation of this locust plague. That's just his context to talk about a devastation that's worldwide, more future, but more devastating than anything we can imagine. So that's the description of their predicament. How about our own? How does that apply to us? Well, we've outlawed God from our schools. You can't have an athletic event without and, and have people pray. Promiscuity and perversion are the official policy of our nation's administration. Teenage promiscuity is promoted with tax-supported condoms and what have you. Murder of the unborn has totally destroyed our social security system by eliminating the workforce that was to pay for it. 35,000 new VD cases each day, and I suspect that's an underestimate. Sin-specific plagues like AIDS, that's a sin-specific plague. We now live in a time when there is no longer any link between character and destiny. That's the way we used to be, bring up our kids. If they had real character, they would, they would prosper. Kids today know better. They speak of entitlements, not what they can achieve. The book of Joel makes two major points. Let me reiterate them before we close. God is in control of world events. Nothing happens anywhere in the world that is outside God's control. Let's remember that. Nothing happens to a believer that's outside God's control. The second point he makes is God responds to repentance. And boy, do we need to cling to that one. Where there's true repentance, God will respond accordingly. Now, chapter uh, 2 and 3 has the, goes, takes all the... Now it focuses, having said all that business about Lucas, they're now going to focus on the future, specifically the events leading to Armageddon, the destruction of the invaders, the repentance of Judah that results from that, then the response of Yorivav Hay to that repentance, and the effusion of the Spirit that is alluded to in Acts in a very unique way we'll deal with. And then the return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of His kingdom in contrast to the day of man. And then chapter 3 is going to talk about the judgment on the nations and the full kingdom blessing that follows. And we're going to take those first six points and next time, chapter 2 next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.